Okay, friends, uh, uh, it's my pleasant duty to introduce the speaker of this lecture. This is the first uh, plenary lecture of the 11th Biennial Conference of NC. Although to this uh, audience, uh, she needs no introduction, quite well known. Now, this lecture by Professor Madhu Kanna and the topic is by Professor Madhu Kanna and the topic of the lecture is on promoting corporate social responsibility in Asia, opportunities and challenges. To say a few words about her. Anna is uh, interim director and ACES distinguished professor of environmental economics at University of Illinois. Anna Champagne, president of Agriculture and Applied Economics Association, 2021-22. Uh, she has many articles in top-rated journals. Her papers of agri environmental technology adoption and policy. And climate change, biofuel and policy, and industry-led environment in industry-led environmental management. Today's lecture seems to me is in the fourth area that I just mentioned. And the topic she is going to talk on uh, today is of considerable interest to me because it deals uh, largely with the interface between industry and environment. And I have been in both areas of uh, research. And I noticed that she has published a paper this year on community pressure and uh, spatial redistribution of pollution. Uh, I remember Professor Emin Murthy, who was my colleague at IG, had uh, once done a paper on informal regulation. Then subsequently, I wrote two papers on river water quality. And uh, there, the issue of uh, informal regulation was an important one. And, some econometric research was done in both papers trying to relate the two. And I don't know, but this might feature in a lecture today. So let me now invite uh, with this initial uh, uh, sort of uh, remarks, let me now invite uh, Professor Badu Khanna for the lecture. Professor Thank, yeah, thanks, Dr. Golder. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me uh, and this opportunity to share my work today. So thank you all. I know organizing um, these virtual meetings can be quite challenging, and uh, this seems to be, um, you know, really well organized. So thank you again. Um, so I'm going to talk um, today about some of the opportunities and challenges for uh, promoting corporate social responsibility in developing countries, and. Uh, this is a brief outline of what I hope to cover today, talk about some of the environmental challenges in developing countries that um, necessitates the need for going in for non-regulatory approaches um, and uh, self-regulation by, by corporations. Uh, some of the lessons that we learned about the effectiveness of trying these non-regulatory approaches in developed countries and how they might apply to developing countries. Uh, as well as other market-based approaches that can be used for environmental protection and some of the opportunities and challenges for that. And then just briefly end with uh, some areas to think about for future research. So as we're all aware, uh, you know, developing countries in particular are facing a growing threat to human health and environmental quality. Uh, rapid economic growth um, has increased reliance on fossil fuels, greater depletion of natural resources, and this is posing a threat to air quality and water quality with significant negative impacts on uh, disease and human health. And um, there is, uh, you know, these countries uh, are very rich in biodiversity, but they face uh, substantial extinct, extinction of um, biodiversity in the coming years, uh, in part because of climate change, as well as um, just extinction of habitat and um, co poor conservation of, uh, you know, resources. And so it's really imperative to, uh, you know, to, to uh, take action to, uh, to stem these negative impacts on, on environmental quality. And um, in part, this comes, uh, you know, there is this conflict between economic growth and environmental protection, um, as well as the limitation of governments alone to be able to uh, do enough to protect the environment. The Sustainable um, Development Goals have emphasized that 
you know, in addition to economic prosperity, there needs to be emphasis on environmental quality and uh, the ambitious goals that have been laid out for sustainable development would require significant resources, financial resources from these countries in order to be able to achieve those goals. And so there is a greater interest in turning to uh, corporations to uh, be more environmentally and socially responsible in order to help development be sustainable in the future. Now, the interest in uh, corporations being more socially responsible is not just true in the case of uh, developing countries. It's actually been uh, as much as important even in developed countries. And there has been this recognition that firms really uh, you know, need to go beyond just the objective of profit maximization to being uh, uh, also being socially responsible. Uh, the motivations for why uh, you know, uh, society expects firms to be socially responsible are different, however, in the developed countries as compared to the developing countries. In developed countries, um, there, uh, you know, uh, it's, there's increasing recognition that uh, relying upon governments alone to set laws and regulations is very time consuming. Uh, there's lots of delays and the administrative burden of setting these regulations can be pretty enormous. And so uh, in the last two or three decades, there's been an increasing emphasis on trying to build a collaborative relationship rather than an adversarial relationship between industry and government and to get firms to voluntarily agree to self-regulate as a way of achieving environmental protection in a much faster, more cost-effective and um, uh, and possibly in a in a way that is uh, also much more environmentally effective than waiting for regulations to be set. Uh, regulations in in developed countries have typically taken the form of what is called command and control, where the government sets the kind of technologies it expects firms to set and to to uh, adopt and these are very uniform uh, they are uh, costly they're not very flexible and so there's a general recognition that um, there, there are better ways to to protect the environment than relying upon the traditional approach that has been used in these countries and so all of that has essentially motivated a um, effort by the government and by the industry to try to self-regulate as a way of achieving environmental protection in a more cost-effective manner. Um, in developing countries, on the other hand, um, it is uh, the reasons for seeking corporate social responsibility is because it can be an alternative to the absence of government regulation. Government regulation is often uh, very limited. Regulatory capacity is, is weak. And uh, the levels of regulatory compliance are much, there's a lot of un under compliance or non compliance. Uh, there is influence of an industry on the regulators and corruption, which allows firms to bypass uh, compliance and regulations. And so all of that is leading to a lot of um, these environmental problems that we have just uh, discussed. Um, there's also the recognition that the, there would be billions of dollars of investment would be needed needed in order to achieve environmental protection and high environmental quality to meet the sustainable development goals. And therefore, it is uh, preferred to be able to uh, engage industry in, in contributing to, uh, to self-regulating themselves and in, in fact going beyond that to even uh, achieve social, uh, social uh, you know, development goals. So the question arises about, you know, how do we get firms to be more socially responsible and under what conditions are we likely to see social responsibility by firms? And uh, given that this is self-regulation, uh, to be sustainable, it needs to be in the self-interest of the firm. So firms themselves have to see the benefit of being socially responsible. And in order for this to be self-enforcing and lasting. And so theory suggests that really there are two primary motivations for firms to self-regulate. And um, one of these is to reduce costs and thereby increase profitability. The other is to be able to differentiate their products and therefore gain market share and greater consumers and so on. And, um, and so various incentives that might exist for firms to do that can essentially be classified into these two types of uh, categories. 
Um, and the graph and the figure on the on the left shows some of these motivations that can lead to, to social responsibility by firms. Um, you know, one of these is uh, just improved technological choices. And um, there is a philosophy, with, you know, which is called total quality management, which suggests that pollution is really a form of waste that is generated because firms are not using their inputs to their fullest uh, potential. And, uh, and so pollution is, is a waste product that is a sign of inefficiency by the firm. And the more firms can prevent pollution, it increases their productivity, and it can increase profitability while reducing their input costs. And so firms that recognize pollution prevention as being in their own self interest might actually reduce pollution and at the same time be able to benefit from doing that. In addition to that, um, you know, there I'm sorry, I did not realize it was muted. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Sorry, did I was I un, was I muted throughout or was I? No, no, just for last five ten seconds. Oh, okay. All right. Not sure what happened. All right. Um, and so. Um, uh, among the other incentives for firms to be uh, socially responsible are those uh, that are uh, set externally by other stakeholders. Um, NGOs and citizen groups and, and environmental interest groups can play a big role in scrutinizing what firms are doing and impose reputational costs on firms that are not, uh, you know, that are violating environmental regulations or um, or um, not being socially responsible. And firms uh, typically do not like to see their uh, names, you know, in the newspaper and um, they are, uh, and so preventing that can be a big motivator. Um, in addition to that, of course, environmental laws and regulations, uh, if they are implemented and are credible, uh, can impose a lot of costs on firms. And, and so preempting stringent environmental regulations, particularly in developing countries, or sorry, in developed countries where um, you know uh, regulators are looking at what firms are doing in order to set the best management practices that firms should be following can actually um, create an incentive for firms to try to shape regulations by being more um, you know proactive in how they're managing their their own environmental performance. Um, so these are some of the reasons. Um, and then uh, you know consumers um, and uh, uh, downstream uh, sort of uh, 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 buyers of products as well as upstream uh, you know firms that are demanding uh, inputs from uh, from these firms uh, can impose pressures on them to be more environmentally responsible. And lastly, capital markets or investors that are that understand that firms that are not environmentally responsible can impose significant, uh, can be subject to a lot of liabilities, uh, high costs and uh, fines and, infor and, and penalties in, in the future may also see sustainable firms as being more profitable and may want to shift investment towards those firms and that can create incentives for being more socially responsible. So there are various regulatory, non-regulatory drivers that can operate on firms. And of course, the key challenge is, are these drivers strong enough? Are they going to make it in the best interest of the firm to be socially responsible um, you know, uh, at, a re at a scale that is needed in order to achieve the environmental quality uh, that, that we desire and will large enough number of firms uh, you know, engage in this. And then the other big challenge is that uh, these are all practices that we are talking about. Uh, whether adoption of these practices will actually lead to environmental improvement is sort of another question. And there's no guarantee that simply by adopting better management practices, firms will actually reduce their pollution and improve their social performance. And so that is another step that needs to be examined. Um, So 
So uh, the regulatory pressures uh, differ in developed and developing countries. In developed countries, uh, there is a very strong regulatory structure. There are penalties for non-compliance. As I said, there's scrutiny by environmental NGOs that can detect non-compliance. And so that creates incentives for firms to actually go beyond compliance uh, so that they can improve their reputation. They can differentiate themselves from other firms. And uh, you know, at the same time, they can preempt uh, regulatory threats by showing government, you know, regula regulators that they're making good faith efforts and uh, shape future regulations, uh, even uh, reduce the stringency of enforcement pressures uh, and, and get fa faster permitting and so on. So, there, so those pressures leading, are leading firms to, um, you know, uh, really go beyond compliance. In developing countries, on the other hand, there is significant under compliance with environmental regulations. And this is, we're talking about domestic firms. Um, and particularly when we're looking at small and medium uh, scale enterprises or firms in the informal sector, many of them are not subject to regulation or the regulatory capacity and enforcement is very weak. At the same time, these civic pressures from NGOs are also weak. And so, in these countries, a lot of the effort is to encourage firms to just get up to compliance uh, rather than go beyond compliance. And, and these efforts at self-regulation and, and um, is, is really main, is intended simply to achieve compliance. So there's a number of mechanisms that you know countries across the world are using in order to promote corporate social responsibility, um, and um, you know in developed countries this started by uh, the government actually establishing these voluntary programs that uh, encouraged firms to participate and to pledge that they would reduce their pollution voluntarily. Um, and, um, you know, or adopt better management practices such as more efficient lighting or, um, you know, more, uh, more renewable energy and, and, uh, and so on. So that, um, uh, you know, they would um, uh, achieve goals and, and reduce pollution that was not being regulated. So prime examples of this are toxic releases in the US or greenhouse gas emissions. These are not, there's no regulation really to uh, reduce them. And passing regulation is very time consuming, subject to a lot of controversy. And um, uh, and so uh, in, while waiting for regulations to be passed, regulators have set these voluntary goals for firms to meet. And many firms have participated in these. Um, in addition to that, um, industry um, and industry associations across the world are setting codes of conduct for their industry, uh, for their firms to, to meet, again, as a way of showing that they're being proactive about um, environmental performance and sustainable development. And uh, some of them are requiring firms to uh, voluntarily report, um, you know, their uh, practices and performance uh, or follow particular uh, codes in order to show that they are they are being responsible. Um, in India is one example where uh, the government actually mandated corporate social responsibility or expenditures on corporate social responsibility by large firms and requiring firms to spend a certain amount on socially responsible projects. Um, in addition to these efforts, um, their firms may themselves, you know, just unilaterally uh, decide that they want to adopt better environmental management systems. Uh, I mentioned total quality environmental management, which is a management philosophy. Many firms follow uh, where they, they believe in improving total quality, not only just product quality, but also environmental quality. Um, there are third party certification organizations like ISO that um, uh, provide um, a credible uh, certification for firms that have adopted better environmental practices. Uh, firms can get eco labeling for their products that uh, certify that the products have been produced in ways that are uh, not environmentally harmful. Uh, and then lastly, uh, there, there is, um, you know, many governments try uh, to have, you know, set environmental info or developed environmental information disclosure programs where there is disclosure of the environmental performance by firms. And this is intended to give the information to the public and to the stakeholders so that they themselves 
themselves can begin to signal uh, their environmental preferences to the firms and create incentives for firms to try to improve their reputation and uh, reduce the adverse impacts of, um, you know, when it is known that they are large polluters. And so all of these are really mechanisms to uh, create these non-regulatory incentives for firms to, um, uh, to self-regulate uh, their performance. Uh, now, these voluntary programs differ a lot uh, in, um, in, you know, uh, some of them, actually very few of them really set numerical targets for environmental performance in terms of the amount of reduction in particular pollutants. Uh, most of them really require uh, simply the adoption of better management practices or better technologies which are more energy efficient like energy star or um uh you know better lighting and um uh, renewable energy and and low carbon technologies and so on um most of them uh, do provide public recognition, which is often a key driver of participation, uh, as well as technical assistance so that firms can find uh, better, uh, you know, techniques for pollution prevention and so on. Um, the implementation of these voluntary programs really requires a credible infrastructure for, uh, the, for the effects to be uh, believable by the stakeholders. Um, and there's been a lot of research in the last two to three decades on, um, you know, under what conditions are these voluntary programs effective in achieving participation and then uh, even going beyond participation to actually achieving improvements in environmental performance. And in general, um, the evidence is really mixed, um, you know, on, on the extent to which there is a lot, often a lot of participation but uh, it, the evidence on whether this achieves environmental improvements um, is really very mixed. And um, at best, what it has been found is that these programs are effective when the public has, an, has the ability to track improvements in environmental performance. So when there are numerical targets, when there is reporting on environmental performance, by participants and non-participants in these programs so that one can actually see what these firms would have achieved you know without participation and what they achieve with participation uh, when that is uh, transparently available to uh, the public and the ngos and so on those are the conditions under which you know these voluntary programs actually achieve uh, uh, you know uh, achieve an improvement uh, in other cases, it is very difficult to actually separate out any improvements that are observed from what would have been observed anyway and where these these firms really went beyond, um, you know, what they might have done uh, anyway in order to achieve really additional improvements in environmental performance. And so, uh, you know, in cases where there are very clear baselines and numerical targets, when there is a very credible threat of regulation, that firms know that you know um, these uh, air, uh, strong regulations are coming in a, within a, the next five to ten years, uh, and so they have to improve, and you know, uh, and they better do that ahead of time because that'll be less costly and so on. Uh, that's those are the conditions under which we really observe improvements in environmental performance. Um, and um, in other cases, it's it's really uh, not very clear to what extent firms are going beyond. Uh, activities that they would have done anyhow. Um, so, um, you know, uh, want to talk briefly about one a case that, um, you know, we've observed in India, which is that um, India is one really the first country to actually mandate, um, you know, firms uh, to spend a particular percentage of their profits on corporate social responsibility projects. And so this was in 2013, they defined these eligible firms that were required to spend on CSR as those being the larger firms with these categories of, uh, you know, um, either based on net profit or net worth or turnover. And um, they there were certain requirements, they had to form a committee, they had to set up a CSR policy, and they had to choose projects that they would spend money on that would serve societal needs. And so here it was very clear, this was not just focused on improving the firm's own environmental performance, 
but rather this was to achieve the environmental and social societal goals of um, the country um, in the form of either reducing hunger, poverty, disease, child mortality, increasing education, um, and, and so on. And so in part, these were uh, designed to help achieve the sustainable development goals and really and go beyond the firm's efforts at making its own operations more environmental and socially responsible. Uh, and so even though this was a mandatory policy, it was actually more a man, uh, hybrid, you know, between mandatory and voluntary because firms were required to spend 2% of their profits before taxes on CSR, um, but there were no penalties if they did not. And um, this was intended to actually make firms, uh, you know, actively engage in projects, to not just uh, give money, but to um, to develop these projects in partnership with NGOs, um, uh, presumably so that they could understand what are the, the development needs um, and uh, do something meaningful with with their money and really benefit society. Um, and so, uh, so there was also the effort to kind of set the social norm for corporate social responsibility. And uh, this would, you know, provide a mechanism for stakeholders to put pressure on firms that were not doing this. Um, and then the, the expectation was that if firms would voluntarily comply with this, then, then there would not be a need for mandatorily imposing this regulation. Um, and so this, this um, you know, uh, now, of course, many firms are already engaging or were engaging in voluntary CSR even before the Companies Act. And um, the hope was that by doing this uh, act, these firms would increase their, um, their expenditures and therefore avoid negative public perception. Um, and, and it was expected that these larger firms would have the human resources, the financial resources, and they would be at greater risk of negative publicity and so they would have more incentive to engage in socially responsible projects and um and so uh, you know and also they would have the incentive to preempt uh future regulations uh which could have meant that this two percent could have become a tax and now this was more voluntary activity that they could uh, they had some flexibility in how they spent it um, but of course, you know, to what extent did these firms really um, do additional expenditures on CSR was a question. They could have also, uh, you know, reduced expenditures that they might have been doing anyway in the form of donations and charitable, uh, you know, activities, and now uh, just switch that over to the expenditures required by this law. And so, uh, so that's sort of one of the questions that we wanted to look at when we studied this particular act. So, um, you know, what we did find, and this is research that I undertook with Sangeeta Bansal, um, and, um, you know, the paper is published in, in the Journal of Environmental Economics and Management, and what we found there was that, in fact, um, you know, we studied only the first two years of reporting by the firms, the first 20, uh, so data that was in 2015 and 2016, and what we found is that uh, firms did significantly increase their reporting of CSR activity. So it, it raised consciousness among firms about needing to do CSR and reporting this in their annual law, uh, reports. And, and, you know, and to that extent, it, uh, you know, served a much needed purpose. Uh, we also, in looking at the expenditures in by these firms, we also found that those expenditures increased dramatically after 2014 by the eligible firms compared to the non-eligible firms. And so, you know, uh, again, uh, you know, that was in, as, as intended. However, if we look at whether firms were really achieving the 2% of their average profit goal, we find that, you know, not, there was a significant shortfall in terms of the amount of expenditures that were being done, although over time that, that increased. And so if we look at, you know, the, uh, CSR expenditures on the vertical axis, and whether it was how, what as a percentage of their average profits, uh, you know, if it had been 2%, it should have been on this 45 degree line, but everything to the right of it, all the points to the right of the 45 degree line show under compliance with the 2% law. And so, of course, by 2016, you see more of those dots falling on the, on the 45 degree line. So compliance improved over time, but was still significantly less than 2%. And on average, 
our results suggest that it was more it was closer to one percent of their uh, profits okay but nevertheless the act did have an impact and if you look at the this threshold uh, firms that were below the threshold for compliance, you know, below the 50,000 rupee um, profitability uh, cat, uh, criteria were doing much less CSR. Firms to the right of that significantly had ramped up their, their CSR. So, you know, the, it was, uh, you know, a positive thing that, that in fact firms did take this seriously and increase uh, CSR, although not necessarily to the level expected, but there was a quite a bit of expenditures now being done on that. Um, and so we looked at, you know, uh, what was the overall impact? Uh, we found that um, as compared to non-eligible firms, these, the, um, you know, eligible firms where there was a 28% higher probability that they would um, participate and, and spend 2%, um, and this increased to 43% by 2016. So it was certainly creating this culture of uh, CSR as, as intended. Uh, more profitable firms were spending more, which was also as intended. And um, But the overall expenditures were close to about 1%. Um, and so, uh, and we also actually did not find that there was much crowding out of other charitable donations. So we did, you know, so that was another positive um, thing. What we did, of course, find is that to some extent, you know, uh, firms that were uh, spending more on their, uh, as a proportion of their profits, um, were now uh, the role that we found a significant role for peer pressure. You know, firms are very competitive when it comes to uh, being seen as leaders in their in their uh, relative to their peers in in doing CSR, and that motivated firms even before the CSR Act in uh, in doing uh, you know socially responsible expenditures. Uh, to some extent, once the Act was passed the role for peer pressure went down. Since all firms were now expected to be spending 2%, um, you know, it, this became part of the expectation rather than as something that they could say, well, they were going beyond the call of duty. And so that there was some diminish diminishment in the expenditures they would have made anyway due to simply uh, peer pressure alone. So what this suggests is that there's a significant potential to raise a lot of resources. Um, and in talking with um, some of the company managers, we found that actually the the um, it was not just the benefit was not just that they was able to spend more on these projects, but it really inculcated this culture of volunteerism and among the employees and the employees you know, uh, love the fact that their company was spending, uh, was, in, you know, going out and educating, setting up schools and things like that, it made them feel better about, you know, the company that they were working for. And so, uh, you know, so in that sense, this was, a, a, this is a positive way to encourage those types of activities. Um, the challenges, however, are that there's really uh, don't seem to be, or at least didn't seem to be any mechanisms, major mechanisms to make sure that the CSR activities were in the areas where societal need was the greatest. And where, as opposed to where the firm's interests were uh, were larger or where it was convenient for the firm to be uh, engaging in CSR rather than where the needs were necessarily the greatest. Um, and, um, and then, you know, how to ensure that the ones that were only spending less than 2% could actually be made to spend more than 2%. And in some ways comes back to requiring the same regulatory structure that is needed for enforcing environmental regulations in the first place, and that is already weak. And so, um, and so, you know, it, it ultimately, in order to achieve the full level or the full potential of these types of voluntary activities, um, you know, one needs that fundamental, fundamentally strong regulatory structure in order to do that. Um, there's also uh, the potential in this for lack of coordination of effort with different firms engaging in CSR as they see fit, rather than necessarily taking into account, you know, 
from the societal perspective where the needs are and how they can coordinate with each other to be more effective. And then um, a number of firms, uh, you know, reported that they were finding it difficult to find projects to spend money on. So even though they had the resources set aside, they were not able to find suitable projects to spend it on. Um, and so, um, you know, and then looking beyond that, to beyond what governments can do, we can look at what market-based pressures can be imposed um, uh, in developing countries. And there are several. Um, there are, you know, uh, what's particularly been uh, getting popular is something called these green supply chains that I'll talk about. Um, there is a potential for final consumers to demand more green products. Um, then there's a role for financial markets, investors and banks. Uh, ecotourism is another market-based approach that could be implemented in order to create incentives for more environmental protection and for uh, tourists, uh, you know, that are willing to pay higher prices for it. So green supply chains have been particularly, you know, touted as something that can um, be an important mechanism to put pressure on uh, suppliers in developing countries. Uh, developing countries are major suppliers for uh, intermediate products to developed countries. And these uh, multinational companies have their own high, you know, global environmental standards. And there is considerable evidence that they maintain their standards and don't lower them to the levels of the national levels of the countries in which they're operating. And so uh, to that extent, they, they actually create pressure on suppliers that are located in developing countries to get environmental certification, be more responsible. And, uh, and so they create pressures through their supply chain for uh, you know, uh, adopting green practices. And by doing that, they can raise standards for these firms in developing countries beyond what might be set by the domestic regulations. Um, and so, um, you know, these types of uh, green supply chains can be particularly effective when uh, the downstream forms are multinationals that are really under heavy scrutiny from social media and consumers and investors and, and NGOs and so on in their countries. And uh, they can, they are creating a demand for uh, firms in developing countries to get ISO certification and to get, you know, to get eco labeling and so on. And um, because these Asian countries are often, uh, you know, rely they rely on export markets and on consumers in developed countries. This is creating a significant incentive for participation in these types of programs. And in fact, adoption of ISO 14001, which is a certification standard for environmental management systems, has really shot up in developing countries, with particularly in, in China and some of the East Asian countries, um, compared to that in a uh, while the number of firms in developed countries has been going down that are participating in this and in large part that is because they are seeking these export markets or they are supplying to multinationals. Um, now these uh, supply chain pressures are more effective when there are you know uh, also other policy drivers in in the domestic countries such as strong national environmental standards or there are you know these free trade agreements between uh with with countries in the west uh, or international environmental agreements so that they can go more wider um you know one of the challenges is that the number of firms that are participating that are uh, you know the suppliers to multinational is a small proportion of the total number of uh, businesses operating in developing countries and so the green supply chains can impose pressure on a small percentage of firms and if we really want them to go to a broader base of firms then they need to be supplemented by these other policy drivers um, and uh, and also the number of products that are being uh, you know, supplied by MNCs that are being produced by upstream producers in developing countries are relatively small. Um, and, and, and then lastly, the consumer concerns in developed countries are often selective and they focus on some practices in developing countries. So their concerns can often be symbolic, you know, like wildlife protection or labor laws or, and so on, and not necessarily cover the kinds of um, you know, environmental problems that are much more uh, pressing and challenging in developing countries, such as urban air quality, because it is hard to kind of relate 
producers directly to those types of problems. And so green supply chains can achieve improvements in certain uh, areas, but not necessarily in the widespread way of protecting environmental quality um, you know, in, in developing countries that is really needed. Um, there are also lots of challenges to how much one can rely upon green supply chains, because the changes to supply chains are often expensive and risky for the MNCs. They prefer to stick to the ones that they are familiar with. Um, finding new suppliers um, is, is often, you know, that can comply, that have meet their certification requirements is not easy. Uh, obtaining ISO certification is expensive and ensuring that in fact the certification is of high quality and being audited by independent auditors is also a challenge that has been observed um, in countries like china and so on uh, and so there's a, a significant role even here for governments to ensure that third-party auditors can operate independently that there is some way to verify compliance with these standards and to provide incentives for firms to get ISO certification beyond just to supply to, to multinationals. Um, there's also other, uh, you know, uh, barriers to other small and medium enterprises that may not necessarily be supplying to multinationals is a high cost of uh, implementation, lack of resources, low environmental awareness within the organization. Um, and, uh, you know, many of these small uh, firms are operating with low margins. Um, and they may not be facing the consumer demand for green products and so on. So this can really limit their incentives to uh, to green to become greener. Uh, and uh, you know, and so the extent to which these MNCs can actually um, you know uh, uh, create incentives for spreading these management practices through not only through their supply chain but then to other firms in the country um, is questionable. Uh, the other motivation that has often been mentioned is that consumers, consumers and public, you know, with preferences for environmentally responsible goods can create a demand if they're willing to pay more or willing to buy those products instead of the uh, less green products, they can increase market share, they can increase revenue through price premiums, firms would prefer to uh, create those products to avoid negative publicity and boycotts. Um, but the big challenge to green goods is that these are credence goods. They don't, the, the environmental quality is not an observable factor. It is something that you have to you have to believe. You have to, it has to be credible, and the credibility comes when there is a trustworthy eco label that goes with it. Uh, and here again, uh, you know, firm governments can play a role by developing standards that are transparent and credible and uh, um, you know uh, and that can create a demand for for these types of products um, the number of eco label products that in asia has been certainly growing uh, again in large part motivated by the need to export to developed countries where uh, these labels um, you know there are there is a greater emphasis on these lab on labeled goods and willingness to pay for that and um, the potential for uh, you know eco labeling to work and on small and medium enterprises is again limited because it is uh, costly to get the label to be able to conduct you know this whole environmental impact assessment of their production process uh, requires expertise financial and organizational capacity um, and ultimately these eco labels are also can be anti-competitive uh, and work against small firms. So um, here too, there's a role for government in providing technical assistance and financial support uh, if this is to be made into a, a major mechanism for inducing uh, particularly small and medium enterprises to become uh, to produce greener products. Um, now you know unilateral initiatives by firms uh, are again another mechanism and here uh, this is work that's been done by Surendra kumar and and uh, his co-author um, and you know which shows that uh, although a small sample of firms in india but really shows that many firms are um, adopting these types of voluntary practices you know they are um seeking iso certification they are they have their own uh 
uh, corporate environmental policy, they're adopting total quality management. So they're doing a number of different things and, and many firms are doing a lot and some firms are doing less. But um, really the um, you know, firm size seems to be a major driver and export orientation seems to be a major driver. So large firms, those that are more profitable, that are exporting, uh, are more likely to do these types of practices and, and the majority of firms which are smaller and medium sized are less likely to do it. Um, so I mentioned the, the role for you know capital markets and uh, uh, you know it's often uh, businesses need financing to establish and grow and uh, particularly converting themselves to greener uh, uh, practices can be initially costly and returns can be uncertain. So providing long term financing is a mechanism that can help them to get established. Um, and these firms can be more profitable in the long run because they have lower environmental risks. Um, and so to that extent, capital markets that recognize that can reward these businesses and lower the cost of capital for them because they, in the future, they will be more profitable. Uh, they can also provide new financial instruments so that they can get loans at lower rates or you know, get, uh, be able to get equity and, and uh, raise debt and so on. Um, at lower costs can help these types of businesses become more, uh, create incentives for firms to become greener. Um, and so there are a number of reasons that uh, have been observed by which, you know, green businesses have lower risk of liabilities and penalties. Um, they often generate higher returns, or at least in the future have the potential for higher returns. And so, uh, at least in uh, developed countries, it's been observed that, uh, you know, when firms, when disclosures are made about poor environmental performance, um, firms that are uh, cleaner get rewarded by higher returns and those that have poor environmental performance often get uh, negative returns on their, neg you know, their, their stock market returns uh, decline. But here too, one has to distinguish between voluntary disclosure versus mandatory disclosure. So mandatory disclosure examples of that are relatively few. One of the major examples of that is this toxic release inventory in the US. And the toxic release inventory was established in 1987 after the, the incident, the gas leak in Bhopal, which led to this emergency um, you know, uh, right to no act in the US that required all manufacturing facilities above a certain level to re to disclose the amount of toxic releases they're generating and these are required they're audited they are reported every you know with a lag of two years and they're publicly available and and so on uh it's very you know credible it's it's transparent you can verify which firm is doing what and so on um, but most other disclosures that are there, particularly the ones in developing countries, are voluntary disclosures, where such as the carbon disclosure program, where companies have the option of, you know, joining it and disclosing their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, in some cases, there have been a few industries or governments or organizations that have set up these green ratings programs. Um, so these are, uh, you know, uh, and there's several examples of these, and these are small scale, these are pilot programs to rate firms in an industry based on environmental performance. And so firms are rated as non-compliant or compliant or, or at different levels of compliance. And um, these are really focused at improving compliance, not at going beyond compliance. And but they do show that firms care about their public reputation and they will make efforts to improve their performance in order to not be blacklisted. Uh, the problem with these types of programs is that they're often short lived, they are static, they really lack the long term information about what these firms are doing, unlike the example of the toxic release inventory. Uh, but nevertheless, there are some examples of these types of programs. Uh, there's one in China, there's another one that was done by um, you know, Professor Golder and Srikant Gupta, and they do show that you know, these can be effective in inducing firms to improve environmental performance 
Um, the types of firms that are likely to improve performance, similar to what we just I mentioned earlier, are largely those that are either owned by foreign for foreign uh, owners, these are export oriented, these are more profitable firms. And um, so in, in, you know, some firms, again, respond, not everybody does. Uh, and uh, overall evidence on, you know, how long these benefits last um, once these programs have, have uh, no, are no longer there is uh, kind of uh, very mixed and limited. On the other hand, when there's mandatory disclosures, then in fact, you can track what firms are doing. And there's a lot of evidence that those that kind of an information disclosure can create incentives for firms to adopt voluntary you know, methods to reduce pollution and to do pollution prevention and and uh, and so on. So, uh, so you know that those types of programs can work, but uh, what is needed to make them really play a bigger role? Well, the the major uh, requirement is that the information has to be trustworthy and credible, and um, it this again you know comes back to the government. It requires government intervention. Um, it has to this information has to be verified. Uh, there should be enforcement for people who are misreporting. Um, and more important, information disclosure will only affect capital markets if the investors believe that uh, these types of firms are going to be, uh, you know, penalized and uh, will face high enforcement costs and be less profitable in the future. Um, if the uh, the general belief is that what matters is profitability and not environmental performance, then information disclosure programs by themselves will not be effective in inducing investors to change their behavior. Uh, there are other methods like providing green finance and, and you know, uh, uh, the, where the banking sector can uh, lower, uh, sort of uh, provide more concessional financing um, and they issue green bonds for investment in low carbon and climate resilient infrastructure um and and so on uh and so green lending can grow it requires developing guidelines requ developing environmental criteria uh in order for uh again creating um methods for encouraging investment in project pro projects so that they can provide returns as well as protect the environment um but uh you know some of the similar challenges that they these green financing programs face is that uh you know one needs to be aware of what these long-term environmental risks are going to be um and uh, the profitability of green financing uh projects can also be limited by other policies in the country so fossil fuel subsidies for example can limit incentives and profitability of green investments. Uh, one needs to know what the threats posed by environmental degradation are on the financial sustainability of the industry in order to really create incentives for financial institutions to take make the effort to invest in more environmentally friendly uh, investments. Um, so, um, so you know relying on capital markets uh to promote csr works to the extent that these are we're looking at large polluters that are consumer oriented or investor oriented firms um and for capital markets support to work it requires infrastructure for data gathering monitoring verification and so on and this is the very reg same kind of infrastructure that is needed for regulatory enforcement that is often missing and so you know this can again limit the just as it limits the ability to have strong regulations it can also limit the ability for capital markets to work in creating uh, these these incentives, particularly when there is a priority that is placed on growth rather than on environmental performance. Um, other markets, you know, for environmental services um, have come up and uh, have the potential to uh, create to protect the environment. One of these is ecotourism. 
um, you know, it can benefit local communities uh, and at the same time by creating jobs and and uh, opportunities, but at, and at the same time conserve the environment because it is the environmental quality that, you know, that they are um, uh, attracting tourists with. Uh, so it can bring jobs and, and also income and so on. But much of the research really on the impact of uh, environmental ecotourism has been mixed, that it's not, it's really failed to fulfill its promise to local communities for various reasons um, and in fact can even be harmful if it is not done in a with proper guidelines because it can cause negative damage to habitats and uh, you know uh, and so on and uh, and that the employment opportunities are often limited uh, and concentrated with with in a with few people that you know uh, often the local people are not the ones that benefit from these eco tourism um, um, activities. So again, it there is a potential for this to grow, but but to increase effectiveness, you know, a number of things need to be done in order to uh, make sure that the recreational use is kind of defined in a way that it is consistent with the carrying capacity of the resources and, and their codes of conduct and local communities involved in implementation of these types of policies um, and to prevent greenwashing and misleading information and so on. So, um, so something that I think requires a significant amount more research and more guide, guidelines on how to effectively implement ecotourism activities. So, um, you know, I want to sort of uh, summarize in that there is a really growing interest and uh, an imperative for involving large firms in developing countries to be more socially responsible. And, um, you know, major example that we've observed most recently in, in the context of COP26 is uh, sort of countries and, and firms voluntarily setting net zero carbon targets, pledging large investments to meet sustainability goals. Um, a lot of that is voluntary um, and there is often lack of accountability, there isn't enough monitoring and transparency to actually know what efforts are being made. Um, there's also considerable, uh, you know, uh, discussion about how the targets that are being set uh, in, for example, in the context of greenhouse gas emission reduction really falls short of the reduction that is needed in order to keep the global temperature change to be less than two degrees centigrade. And that you know, most companies do not report their most significant sources of emissions, and uh, it, which suggests that they're not really managing them. Um, additionally, you know, very few companies set targets for ma managing other environmental impacts, such as reducing water use, wastewater, other pollutants that are causing air quality problems, and that the participation in these initiatives is limited to large firms that are export oriented, that are foreign owned or part of the supply chain for multinationals and extending that to smaller domestic firms that are outside the supply chain can be a challenge. Um, greening is still not being practiced by the majority of businesses which dominate the business landscape. Uh, and this just shows that the, you know, these SMEs account for the dominant share of firms in developing countries and they're often outside this incentive mechanism that I've just described that works for the larger firms. Um, and so really what is needed is that to promote green businesses, it requires a robust regulatory framework. It requires more proactive engagement by the domestic civil society and pressure from markets for, for consumer goods, capital markets, and the types of markets for ecosystem services that for example, the ecotourism sector, um, so that it can really impose regulatory and non-regulatory pressures on these firms. Um, most of these civil and green supply chain pressures are really coming from outside the Asian or developing country region. They're coming from developed countries and um, based on the environmental regimes and the consumers in those countries. And so their attention is focused on a small subset of the environmental problems in developing countries and not necessarily on the most pressing local environmental problems that are affecting local communities. So uh, much more, you know, I think a combination of these types of pressures in, in addition to regulatory pressures and more financial 
support for uh, for firms so that they can green themselves is needed in order to really have more widespread um, engagement by firms and environmental performance. Um, I've just sort of a few areas here for further research um, that you know I hope we'll we'll um, get into some discussion about. But you know the we've seen the CSR Act. Uh, we know that it can be effective, but is it really contributing to sustainable development and and more um, sort of information on the types of projects that are being undertaken and their societal benefits? Um, and is this really a better way to achieve these sustainable development goals than taxing taxing the profits by the government and having the government undertake this effort? Um, that's you know to be determined. Um, there's also uh, you know not a whole lot of work that's been done in developing countries on the role for non-government organizations in promoting CSR. Um, how effective are these? Has the effectiveness of NGOs increased in a positive way with, for example, the CSR Act in India and otherwise? Um, consumer willingness to pay for green goods. Uh, you know, most of the research in developed countries suggests that it's very mixed. Uh, consumers are, um, although they claim to be very willing to pay more for green goods, but really when it, the observed information suggests that that willingness is much lower than is stated in surveys. Um, the carbon disclosure project, you know, is prevalent in, it's a global project, um, you know, uh, large participation by firms in India as well but um, very limited research actually examining to what extent it is effective in achieving additional reduction in carbon emissions beyond those that would have been done anyway. And in large part, that is because it is, um, you know, uh, not, um, uh, uh, it, it's voluntary, it's self-selected, and it is not um, uh, easy to track uh, performance and compare performance of those that are part of this CDP and those that are not part of the CDP. So it's, it's um, um, you know, difficult to uh, quantify the additional benefits uh, of, by firms of participating in this in terms of greenhouse gas reduction. Um, and then, uh, you know, again, find the financial sector can play a huge role and uh, in, in uh, promoting environmental social responsibility, but one that has not been studied very much either here or in the developed uh, yeah, country context. So, um, so let me stop with that. Happy to take questions and, um, and have a discussion. Well, thank you, Professor Khanna. Uh, this is a very good lecture and uh, very well organized and uh, thought provoking. Came up with uh, certain good suggestions for policy. Before I uh, open up uh, this to the floor, I don't know how we are going to have the questions, uh, Gaurav. I mean, if there are something I see in chat box, or are we going to ask people to speak themselves? So, uh, but there so, is no hand shown anywhere, so I don't know. So, the thing is that, Professor Goldath, only you can see that in your chat because they are directed to you. So, because you are the chair. Uh, you have received the questions, none of us have. I have received the questions. So, so there are eight, eight questions that have come. Yes. Okay, before I do that, uh, I thought I'll just make two observations, which is uh, kind of uh, um, somewhat related to what uh, Professor Khanna spoke. The first thing I want to say is that, uh, uh, of course, there is an, uh, it is right that the, um, in terms of uh, control of pollution, the performance of firms in a developing country, say India or elsewhere, would be relatively worse. At the same time, there are firms or there are uh, industrial undertakings where the uh, performance is exceptionally good because, uh, I mean, this is coming in connection with the study uh, green rating project and the paper that uh, uh, Shri and I wrote. And you see, the, in the green rating, the score out of 10, only score of two is given if somebody is uh, able to reach the uh, standards as specified by the law. And many people I think are getting scored much above that. And I think it would be two. I don't remember all the things details now, but one would might get one star, but there are uh, establishments or enterprises having two stars, three stars. That means there is considerable amount of over compliance. And this is not one or two uh, 
So, I mean, this is one aspect that has to be kept in mind. There are people or there are enterprises there who on their own uh, are doing much better than what the law requires them to do. The second thing I want to draw your attention is that uh, uh, this paper by uh, Kumar and somebody mentioned, which shows that uh, those who are exporting uh, have, have um, adopted ISO 14,000 and plus some certain other environment related initiatives, uh, which is right. And I think there is international literature also of this kind. But uh, the out of the, say, uh, uh, companies, manufacturing companies in India, nearly 50% are exported. I mean, how do we see this thing? If we say that it is a relatively small section of people who are engaged in export market, 50% of the companies are uh, exporting. Maybe not that much, but everybody is exporting some portion of their, uh, about only 50% are not exporting. And uh, there is a study uh, by, um, I don't remember the name, uh, that has shown that uh, exporting, uh, I'm not able to get the name now, uh, that exporting uh, is associated with uh, ISO 14001 uh, adoption. Interestingly, it is relatively higher for those who are exporting to China. So uh, I thought I'll bring this. Now let us uh, go to the questions. Uh, so I will then look at this chat. Uh, so oh, let me, I I can, yeah, while, while you're doing that, I can, yeah, great, great comments. Um, I guess my response to them that, you know, we certainly have seen, as I said, that there is a remarkable amount of efforts by firms in India to be more socially responsible. There is no doubt about that. The um, Just with the CSR Act, as well as, um, you know, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence uh, that the big companies, you know, the Tatas and Birlas and all are doing a lot and many others as well. Uh, at the main point that I was trying to make is that, you know, how widespread is it beyond that top layer of firms? And, you know, how deep does that go? And is this going to be sufficient to deal with the environmental challenges that we are observing? Uh, so that that's sort of, you know, what what are the areas in which they're making environmental improvements and are they actually going to improve environmental Um, um, I think uh, uh, there's some disturbance in your. Uh, in oh, your, sorry. Uh, it's audio, there is some problem. But uh, okay. now I have here uh, nine questions. Should yeah. So now it's visible. Is it all the chats are visible? No, we can see everybody on the screen. Uh, uh, so maybe you could uh, share the screen, then we would be able to see your chats. The chats are only visible to be in, right? Okay. Should then uh, the should, can, should I ask then the person concerned to uh, uh, speak? Um. Because, yeah, we can do that. But I think if you have the chats in your uh, okay, in your then box, I'll I'll, re I'll read them out. I read now, them one, out. Uh, uh, there is one chat. The first one which came is from Surya Jiji Gunta. With yes. SBI mandating BSR reporting for listed 1,000 companies from the next financial year, what are your thoughts on its efficacy in sustainability, environmental, social, responsible? Do you think environment impact assessment and social impact assessment needs to be measured for really go beyond compliance? Sorry, I missed the question. You might, if you could, if you don't mind. Yeah, I'll, I'll read it. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll say it again. With SEBI mandating BRSR reporting from listed 1,000 companies from next fiscal years, what are your thoughts on its efficacy in sustainability, environmental, social responsibility? Do you think environment impact assessment and social impact assessment needs to be measured for really go for really to go beyond compliance? Yeah, I mean, certainly, I think the more reporting there is, the, you know, the better it is in at least raising consciousness about the need to pay attention to this. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the key uh, sort of questions are what environmental impacts are being asked to be reported, 
um, you know, how are they being tracked and verified? How does one know that these are in fact additional to what the firm would have done anyway, because it's, in, uh, you know, for other reasons um, and so on. So there's, uh, you know, I think it's good to know that they're asking for this reporting um, and, but whether this is sufficient and how far it's going to go are some of the research questions that would come up. Yeah. Also, the same person has asked the question of about blockchain technology and say, can adopting blockchain technology fix the trust or the supply chain eco level? Do you have any views on that? We lost Madhu's video. Okay. But uh, audio also, Madhu. Madhu, are you there? Perhaps uh, something happened. Yeah, I think her connection dropped. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, maybe we wait for a couple of minutes and see if she's back. Ah, yeah, she's there back. she is. Okay. We, we just right. lost sorry her. About for that. Five I my, yeah, no, sorry. Is. Okay. Um, so, I, you know, all of these things certainly help. I think the more we have these kind of technologies that can help us to uh, trace the environmental performance throughout the lifespan of life cycle of a commodity uh, and verify it, uh, you know, that's certainly what we need. Uh, that's one of the things that's been missing so that we don't really know uh, what, you know, the, the environmental impact of a product was from beginning to end. And um, more, you know, having more of these kinds of technologies is definitely better. Um, so, okay, Madhu, this is another question which says, "What is uh, what is your feel about the role of media in this regard, and what is incentives still remain heavily dependent on state command and control?" So, what uh, what do you feel about this? Um, you know, I think the. Um, well, uh, um, at least in the US, I would say that there's been research which shows that, uh, you know, negative and positive news releases can make a significant impact, have a significant impact on stock market returns of companies. And I would imagine that that is likely to be the case even here. I think there are some problems with uh, Madhu's uh, for public. Madhu, your 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 signal is fading. Companies. Of oh, sorry about that. I'm going to turn off my video. That might help the audio to yes. be better. So let yes. me try that. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. Hopefully yeah. this will work. Sorry about that. No problem. Um. So um, uh, you know. I, I mean, I think the sort of the common sense answer really is that uh, media reporting can help. Um, you know, what the overall impact is going to be really depends upon what the consequences of that are. And that depends on whether that firm is, is it being, uh, you know, is it going to be impacted in the capital market? Are there boycotts? Are there other impacts by the civil society? Uh, so media reporting by itself, unless it's followed up by some other consequences, may not go far enough in changing form behavior, um, but it's certainly um, a start, so. Okay, the next question is uh, whether uh, CSR activities in India in the sphere of ensuring environmental sustainability are linked to government mandated projects or private sector initiatives, or is it a mixture of both? Um, I think it's really, um, you know, I think it's probably more uh, a, a mixture or really just motivated, um, you know, by, by pressures by the market itself to whatever extent they exist. I don't, um, you know, I think the only evidence we've seen of a government-based program is this in 2013, uh, regulations which are the command and control type and uh, it is, you know, uh, those regulations create any incentive to do 
CSR. They, you know, they only create incentives to meet and comply with those regulations at best using the uh, required approaches to do that. So there's, in fact, that's one of the big limitations of command and control regulations. And so the voluntary programs in the in the US have been designed to kind of go beyond those command and control regulations to pollutants that don't have those types of regulations. So most of what we're talking about in developed countries is uh, related to pollutants that are not subject to command and control. In, in India, it is not clear that, you know, which pollutants are these firms trying to reduce when they are adopting these different types of practices. Um, there's really lack of transparency to know, um, you know, what, when firms say they're, they're doing ISO and, you know, TQM and so on, you know, what pollutants are they aiming to reduce as a result of that? that is not known. Um, and does it even improve their compliance with existing regulations? So I think there's a lot of room for more detailed research on this question. It's, um, it's currently, I think the evidence is not there. Okay, we have uh, three more. Uh, very briefly, you can answer. Of course, we can go up to one. One is the, your uh, views or reflections on the buzz around mainstreaming environmental, social, and corporate governance agenda for capital market and investment in developing countries. If there is such a view, what is this buzz? What do you feel? And what is your views on this? Of mainstreaming? Well, I, I you know, um, certainly mainstreaming is, is important. I think raising the profile of this is important. Um, but, um, uh, you know, really helping to internalize this is the challenge. And um, which means that, uh, you know, uh, seeing environmental, uh, seeing ESG as being something that is not conflicting with economic growth, but actually is important for economic well being. Mainstreaming that idea is really the important one. And that is very hard, um, you know to to um to make a convincing case off it shouldn't be that hard um you know when one sees the cost imposed by um poor air quality and disease and so on um you know uh, it should not be a hard case to make of why we need to have environmental quality in order to improve productivity and and achieve more but um, in the short run, it's very hard to, to make that case. And especially because environmental quality is often more expensive to obtain. And if it wasn't, we would have already had it. Uh, and, so, um, and so that's, I think, the, the key question. Um, but at least raising awareness of that can help, um, you know, but um, uh, I, uh, part of the, the issue is also that there is uh, a lot of pollution that is caused by by not the the, the companies. It, these are you know by uh, all various other sources. I mean mobile uh, sources and so on. Um, so uh, so that's another sort of a separate challenge. Um, so let me stop with that. Um, Okay, now uh, one question that is actually sorry, I didn't, uh, I did not uh, tell the names of the people who were uh, asking these questions. Perhaps I should do. Uh, these are uh, Surya, Jidi Gunta, Jedi Gunta, and then uh, Lavena Suresh. Then I have Gayatri Kunte, um, and then I have uh, uh, Robin Singal, and finally a question uh, from. Uh, Kishore Dere. Then there is a comment from Aparna Sahani, which I will answer. So Kishore Dere says, what is the difference between Asian and approach and Western approach towards CSR? Is there a difference way, the way Western state and Indians or for example, Asian state? No, not really. I mean, in both cases, CSR is really going beyond, um, you know, what is the minimum required by regulations to kind of self internalizing external impacts and showing that you know you're being more responsible and proactive and managing and accounting for your environmental impact so so definitionally it is not there's no difference it is just that 
um, some of the drivers of CSR are different in developed and developing countries, and some of the reasons for wanting CSR are different in, in different countries. But, um, you know, the definition of CSR is really, you know, it's, it's the same. The standards might be a bit different, um, you know, and the expectations, but um, um, in, in developed countries, and to a large extent, it's sort of going beyond compliance, as I said. And uh, whereas in developing countries where there isn't often enough compliance, it may be just a case of getting up to compliance or not really being non-compliant. So, okay. Now, can, there is a one I, uh, last comment. Uh, okay. Sorry, uh, Srikant. There is one last no, no, comment. No, I will, uh, okay, I, after you've answered these questions, I have a couple which I haven't posted, but I, if you allow me, I'll ask them orally. Okay. You can finish Something the... I'll, I'll finish with uh, maybe Aparna. Aparna has written, Aparna Sahani, 50% of the Indian firms being exported is an inflated share. I was also very uh, sort of surprised to see this. You can see the paper by uh, uh, Sasidharan and Atma or somebody, or there are a number of other papers. In Sasidharan's paper, the figure is about 70%. And I agree, this came as a big surprise because in the annual survey of industries, only 8% of the factories are uh, exporting. And even those belonging to corporate sector, only about 8 9%. So I was shocked. I thought something is going wrong because I, I'm involved with the annual survey of industry. And hearing, there we are reporting only 8% factories are report, uh, exporting, but 50% of the manufacturing companies to whom these factories belong are reporting. Then as I thought more and more about it, this puzzle became clear to me, how is this possible? Anyway, if somebody is interested in knowing uh, we, we, about what percentage of Indian uh, companies are exporting, one can look up the, the studies on exports. Incidentally, in the Indian uh, growth and development, the ISI conference that is forthcoming, I have a paper there. Uh, you may like to see that uh, because papers become downloadable in their conference uh, uh, page. And uh, you can see that there you will see uh, the, the speak differences there. And you also see why this difference. Yeah, I didn't want to take up the time here, but it is certainly well within 10%, whether one does it by firms or by factories. No, no, uh, but no, uh, yeah. no, this is not right. Anyway, we cannot discuss it here, yeah, yeah. but I don't know, since you're working with uh, uh, Bravest data, you can see it yourself, whether it is uh, right or wrong, because if you look at manufacturing companies, it has to be more than 50. Yes, yeah, she can. But you can, you can look at my paper. You can see my paper because it's now become public again. She can't. Well, well, yeah, no, thanks, Madhu. That was a really, really interesting talk. Just one thing that uh, there was a question earlier about the role of media in developing countries. So, you know, there is an old paper by Susmita Dasgupta and Benoit Laplante in uh, GM mm -hmm. 2001. And uh, it's an old paper, 2001. But what uh, Susmita and uh, Benoit did was they looked at newspapers in four countries. I think it was Argentina, Chile, Mexico and Philippines. So they looked at these four countries and they looked at one newspaper which had the largest circulation in that country. And over a four year, five year period, they pulled out news reports of different firms on environment. And then they found that that had a significant negative abnormal return. So that, that there is that one old mm -hmm. paper. Uh, I don't think that kind of work has been again done again about the role of media. But like you said, Common sense tells us that uh, adverse publicity of um, you know news in um, in the media will affect firms' performance. So there is that old paper, Benoit Laplante. I will I I, I can put no, it. Shikan, there is a paper by Vinish Kathuria for India where a similar story I think has been shown how newspaper reports can uh, have an effect on the firms. Yeah, I though I don't know if he does it through the abnormal return route, which is the one. Oh, that, no, not abnormal return. Yeah, so yes, that, that is an event study. So basically, it's an event study methodology. And as uh, as uh, BN mentioned, the Gupta and Goldar paper continues that event study. And uh, if you permit, uh, this is in bad taste, but, um, you know, we followed up, um, Madhu, the green rating project of the CSC, which Gupta and Goldar used, Mm -hmm. We did a follow-up study on that, which is unfortunately not published, but it's on the D-School working paper series, where we found something very interesting, which I think people should know, that we went back and looked at the same firms 
uh, some of so in paper and pulp what we did was we focused on firms that were rated in the first round of uh, green rating and in the second round we found something very interesting which i think people should know that firms who were re-rated and did worse than the first time were really hammered in the stock market so uh, if you have if you if you reduce if you if your performance goes down then uh, the stock market penalizes you a huge amount and this happened incidentally despite the methodology becoming much more complex so uh, rather than using the standard uh, car uh, and the z statistic we use the kolari pionen statistic so that is a much higher standard of proof so the kp statistic as it's called shows much uh, lower normal returns but even there we found that so again i don't want to mm -hmm. go on but it's a very interesting finding which uh, um, you know if you permit me i can put it in the chat uh, the reference to it uh, sorry this is not yeah. meant to be uh, no, but it's I'm... very directly related yeah. to this yeah no and and we had a similar thing which we did for the tri that you know we looked at repeated provision of information and in fact um, firms that continued to perform badly below expect, investor expectations continued to get worse returns and so this is a, it can be a long lasting effect and that creates even more incentives um you know for these firms to improve behavior um again the uh, you know i think the main uh, i guess the important takeaway from all of this is that for the media to work and to have these you know to be able to report negative or positive it needs to have sources of information and and there has to be uh, you know and and typically that there is you know lack of information it's so hard to know what firms are emitting what are their who is non compliant you know in order to i mean if we look at the study that was done by surinder kumar i mean it was he had to go through uh, foia to be able to get the information from the state pollution control boards and then you get it for 100 firms only and those are probably the best performing firms that have released their information so the the big challenges are actually finding out what firms are really doing and um, you know once one gets to that point then all of these mechanisms can certainly work you know yeah so the whole idea of habitual offender like in law when you go before a you know is it the first time you have done it or the second time you have done it so if you're a habitual offender then they come down at you more heavily so that is the interesting thing yeah. found and of yeah. course all these econometric issues of selection bias and so on are exactly. are very interesting but uh, yeah. yeah so yeah. that's the uh, thing. and the other well the other point about these event studies is that you know they only pick up the effects that on environmental performance that were not expected by the investors because if the investors already know that this is a poor performing firm its market value is already low and it's not going to pick up any further negative impact and so it only has to be for the unexpected release of information which then limits the information you're really getting from this kind of a method um you know um, uh, so so there's some econometric challenges and what you can learn from stock market returns, but it does show that investors do care. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Madhupanna, for the lecture. So with that, we can now close the session. Yeah. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Enjoyed the discussion. Well, uh, thank you, thank you, Brian. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Madhu, for here. We are, of course, uh, this is. Part one, part two. I saw Ram Prashadda in the early part of this uh, uh, lecture, and uh, Ram Prashadda will be uh, chairing your second session, which is tomorrow at eleven thirty. And just to give you a trailer or a teaser, is that sometimes um, disclosure is a bad thing. So you can see the abstract of um, uh, you know Professor Khanna's talk at our website, and of course you can also see her slides and her readings. And this is a fascinating piece of research where you show that actually when news is given, these firms uh, scoot off to uh, places which are uh, worse off, so poorer people. So the whole environment justice idea that dirty industries are located in areas where are poorer and less literacy and, you know, perhaps blacks and, you know, in the U.S. So that's tomorrow. So that's the trailer for tomorrow, which I think it will be a very... Uh, 
provocative and stimulating. And for us in India, Madhu, the whole idea of environmental justice is a very interesting idea. So, so please watch this space. Come back tomorrow at 11.30. Of course, we, you'll come back now, but you do come back to hear uh, Professor Khanna. And um, uh, I, I don't know if you mentioned this, but uh, um, uh, Madhu Khanna is uh, the president of the Applied um, uh, uh, Aggie Corn Association. Uh, the first uh, person... No, I did mention Shikant. I did mention oh, I see. So the first person from uh, of Indian origin to be our president. So really proud of that, uh, the proud of this achievement.